Good morning. Um, I promise this will be the last time I will get up on the stage with the microphone. Um, I'm hugely impressed to see so many people here on a Saturday morning. Um, well done, it's really good to see everybody here, uh, which is our uh, last main day of the plenary meeting. We've got the brunch tomorrow as well. Just a few things that I wanted to uh, inform you of and confirm. Um, so we still have um, some tickets available for the shows in the artistic program for Middle Child, which is here at Hull Truck and Sound Uproar. Um, and we still have tickets for Kaleida's show, The Money, which is uh, a matinee at the Guildhall this afternoon and in the evening. Uh, and there are very limited tickets left for Ella Mesmer Company and, the, and uh, Scotty as well. Uh, just a few things to mention. Um, just to remind you that um, at one o'clock on Sunday morning, the clocks go forward in the UK. Just to remember in terms, so that impacts on a couple of things, your travel on Sunday, and also uh, when we're in the late night meeting point having our party, when it's one o'clock, it's actually two o'clock, okay? Um, and because of licensing laws, we cannot extend. Um, so just, just to make sure, on your, your phones should, should uh, change automatically. Um, secondly, um, I have been informed that there will be some um, uh, train strikes tomorrow. P please do not shoot the messenger. Um, the best thing I can recommend is that you check at the Paragon Interchange with the, with the uh, rail authorities there. There will be bus replacement services, but just please anticipate and take that into account. Um, the uh, other thing as well is um, Marco is our opening keynote sp um, speaker this morning. Marco informed us at the beginning of the week that he had um, some pro family problems in terms of his, his mother was unwell. Unfortunately, Marco has not been able to attend. However, with the miracle of technology, we're going to stream Marco in from Belgium. So we will have Marco and his presentation um, on, on the screen, which I'm sure that it, it, it won't impact too much. So just before I hand over to Mark Babbage, who is the Artistic Director of Hull Truck in this venue, which has very kindly hosted us, please do enjoy the, the day. You've brought the sunshine with you for the whole weekend, and it's going to stay with us for the whole time. I do hope to see the rest, uh, many of you through the day, and also, if you can and you have the energy, please let's all get together at the closing party at the Humber Street Late Night Meeting Point. If you haven't been there, please do come and join us this evening. So, if I can introduce you to the artist director of this wonderful Hull Truck Theatre, Mark Babbage. Good morning, everybody. Um, fantastic to see you all. Um, well done for getting up early, for those of you partying last night. Uh, thanks, Chris, for wearing the same shoes as me. <laughs> there is a director colleague of mine in the, in the city um, who quite often I turn up at things and we're dressed exactly the same and we're collectively known as Gilbert and George of Hull. So um, <laughs> I, I don't quite know what we, uh, what we look like, Chris, but you've got more hair than me than, anyway. Um, the, welcome. Um, it's such a thrill to have uh, you in this building um, and it really does mean a lot to us. And thank you for all your energy and creativity. Um, it really makes a difference, I think, when this building is populated with conversation, uh, with the ebb and flow of, of artists exchanging ideas, audiences. That mix of that energy really helps to make me feel that actually uh, a theatre is doing its job when it invites in multiple conversations. And not only is it about for us listening, it's about how we, we translate that listening into action. And I've heard many, many conversations this week that have been utterly thrilling for us, and we're going to take them back into our teams next week and ask the question, what can we do to continue this process of change? Um, many people have said, and uh, I think we're all very aware of, uh, we, we do live in some very testing times of change and division. And clearly, I think we need artists to use their power to see the world through a different lens and demand a fairer and just society, and a kinder society. This is a time of intense change and people 
really still living through the hard end of austerity. And what we do is extraordinarily powerful when handled well. And we should be mindful of how we can use our power to the greater good. And we need to acknowledge those that are genuinely struggling and those that continue to feel that they have a lack of voice. And they, these people, are quite rightly, are demanding to be heard and to be in the room when we need to listen and take action. I don't think anyone has expressed this more powerfully than the amazing Jess Tom yesterday. I mean, what a speaker, what an artist, what a great human being uh, Jess is. And uh, I was reflecting to a, a number of colleagues that, you know, if we wanted to quickly catapult the transformation and change, invite Jess into your organization and, and explode that thought bomb into your organization and see what happens. Um, the, her call for power and responsibility and inclusion is, is with us, uh, taking action together. Uh, a very powerful statement of fear creates barriers. And just that simple thing of reduce the faff, reduce the fuss. But the one thing I will definitely take away is that next week, uh, my colleagues and I are definitely going to think about what a fuck a goat the policy means for Hull Truck Theatre. <laughs> Those of you that weren't here yesterday, that might sound very odd indeed. <laughs> but watch Jess on YouTube. She's truly, truly an inspiring human being that we can all really learn from. Um, six years ago, um, we began a big process of transformation here at Hull Truck Theatre. And our aim was to create an organization that welcomes multiple voices and see this as a creative muscle to be flexed and to be celebrated. Um, we've had our successes, but we've also had our very gallant failures. Uh, I just want to tell you a few of those successes. Um, our Community Dialogues program is an action research program uh, which we started because simply we didn't know enough about the barriers that existed. We made too many assumptions. And so we put our, uh, in place our action research uh, program, community dialogues, into uh, the barriers and how we could overcome them. And we worked specifically on Orchard Park and Thornton Estate. And some of the things that have come out of that are simple things like pay what you can uh, performances for every single whole truck theater performance. And this is really not just about the, the, the economic barrier but it's also about behaviors and assumptions and language. Um, and uh, a lot of our work has been to understand at a deeper level what those are. Terms like box office, terms like interval, foyer, uh, and it's absolutely okay to be vocal. Those performances have taught us a lot about things in our industry that have been long-standing and things that perhaps we just need to challenge and. Uh, challenge the assumptions of behaviors in theaters. Uh, we have a cross-departmental inclusion group. So that's not just a group that is uh, senior-led. This is uh, led throughout the entire organization. And it's a way of saying it's all our responsibility. So that inclusion group deals with programming, recruitment, well-being, accessibility. And it's about Hull Truck Theater trying their very best to continue the journey of the big welcome, that everything on the way to the seat matters. And the connectivity is not just the show on stage, it's everything in this building on the way to the seat matters. We now um, uh, have introduced an inclusive casting policy, which means that any actor will be taken seriously for any role, regardless of their protected characteristics. And there's a huge commitment to gender balance across our creative teams in the entire whole truck theatre producing season. Our programming uh, is continuing to be more representative of modern Britain. Uh, we have new theatre makers making a noise on our stage. We've got one, two in this building that you can witness, Mental Child with their bilingual production of Us Against Whatever. Silent uproar tiling in mental health. And there's a couple of other companies who are not doing shows as, as such, but sh um, companies we support and are very proud of. The Roaring Girls with their strong feminist and funny or an authentic voice. The Herd with their early years work and our international collaborations with Pudda Pudda, the Market Theatre. And shortly, we will be uh, beginning a, a, a huge project with the amazing Freedom Festival on a big inter the biggest international project I think we've ever undertaken. Um, I think the biggest thing I have to say, really, is that this is hard. And 
trying to, we are all trying to do something that is very hard, and somewhere we're going to miss something. And the important thing about that is that we've got to recognize uh, it when we do, and we'll try all the time to do it better. And frankly, dealing it with it when, it when it doesn't happen. There are going to be times when you step on landmines. There are going to be times where things that you haven't thought of suddenly explode, and it's how you deal with it and how you take forward. And to do nothing is no longer acceptable. Um, you've got to be, I think, in, uh, invite and welcome and be open to be channel, challenged. And uh, uh, 18 months ago, uh, my dear colleague Amanda Huxtable came on board as a change maker here at Hull Truck Theatre. And Amanda's voice within our organization has really transformed the way we think, uh, the way we move forward, and it's just part of the evolution of this company. And one of the things that I do know uh, from that amazing, and those of you that don't, don't know Amanda, she is around, you should try and meet Amanda, she's an amazing human being and a director who I think is going to make a big impact on the industry. We should never feel that we've arrived. Because um, when we've arrived, we stop, we relax, we close our eyes to the world around us, but the world continues to change. And we need to develop our muscle to continually keep an eye on this, because change is a continual thing. And there will be those times when we think we've arrived and we've not. We've just got to keep an eye on that. Uh, my last th uh, thoughts are thanks to Hull Truck Theatre staff for continuing their big welcome. Um, it's been fantastic to meet up with some um, old colleagues the last few days. Um, if you haven't come and say hi, come and say hi, I'm around. It'd be really nice to speak with you, hear what's going on in your lives, in your organisation. Um, I'm going to introduce Marco Martiniello now, who's uh, the director of the University of Liege whose keynote is on art, ethnicity, and migration. Thank you for your time. Have a lovely day. Thank you. OK. Can I go? Yeah? OK, good morning, everybody. I'm very sorry not to be able to be with you this morning, physically, I mean. Uh, I can assure you it's not the fear of Brexit that prevented me to travel but uh, severe problems in my family. Um, I would like today to, to share a few thoughts with you about the complex relationships between arts, ethnicity, and migration. And I will not go into the definitions. I mean, we could probably spend more than uh, the allocated time uh, to discuss about the def definition of arts, ethnicity, and migration. And I uh, will not go in, into that this morning. I will just start by saying, from my point of view, I am not an artist, unfortunately. I'm a sociologist specialized in migration and ethnic relations. And what we've witnessed over the past 30 years is really an explosion of the academic literature on the issue of the integration of immigrants in Europe, in the US, in Canada, but also in other parts of the world. There are all sorts of research available about integration into the labor market, about housing, about uh, uh, discrimination, racism, and I will come back to that point later. But at least in social sciences, uh, one issue was really has really been sort of neglected. Uh, and it is precisely the relationship between arts and the incorporation of migrants, but also the descendants of migrants, and more broadly, I would say, the relationship between arts and migration. I mean, in the social science field, of course. Uh, in the US, one of the first books uh, discussing uh, thoroughly the importance of arts in the life of immigrants was only published in 2010 by uh, Di Maggio and Fernandez, uh, the first one, Paul Di Maggio, being a sociologist of, of culture. And you know, for a country that praises itself of being a nation of immigrants, it is quite uh, bizarre that the social sciences 
and especially sociology of migration has neglected the issue of the connection between arts and migration. In the European Union, uh, the issue is even, I would say, uh, more difficult because actually uh, we started with colleagues from different European countries, uh, uh, a standing committee in a network called IMISCO. For those who don't know, IMISCO stands for International Migration and Social Cohesion in Europe. It is a network of research institutes specialized in migration issues, funded about, uh, founded about 15 years ago. And within that you know, broad network, we actually are, have now about 47 research institutes and more than 500, 600 researchers dealing with migration in Europe, but also outside of Europe. Uh, in that network, actually, there was very little on the issue of arts and culture. And with my colleagues from uh, Vienna and uh, Barcelona, Vipke Sievers, who is a, a specialist on literature, and um, my colleague Ricard Zapata from Pompeo Fabra University of uh, uh, Barcelona, we decided to create a standing group on arts and migration. And actually, initially, our colleagues were not very enthusiastic about the idea. You know, people think that when you talk about migration, you have to think about hard stuff, you know, the labor market and uh, uh, housing, health, and so on, which of course is very important and crucial. But we tried to convince our colleagues that it was very important to, to uh, examine and pay attention to the symbolic dimensions of the debate surrounding migrant, migration and ethnicity, and also to dedicate some time in trying to develop a research agenda on these relationships between arts, ethnicity, and uh, migration. And that's what we've been doing, I would say, quite successfully uh, over, over the years. Uh, and the first think we try to, to analyze is basically why this neglect historically on the connection between arts and migration. And I see basically two major reasons that are related to the history of migration and that are related also to the history of colonialism and to the history of the imperialist Eurocentric a view of the world that developed on this part of the world. If we take into account uh, the way migration was constructed, actually for decades, the image was that migrants were just workers. They were factors of production. So actually they had no culture, they had no aspiration to become citizens, and they were supposed not to be interested in arts, either as producers or as consumers. You know, you can read, if you read the literature about migration, uh, starting from the, the end of the 40s onwards, you really have that idea very much that migrants actually are dehumanized. They are just considered as a simple factor of production. And I remember uh, this uh, passage, I can't remember the name of the author uh, now, but he was saying, talking about migration, we uh, have imported arms and you know, we realized actually that there are also human beings wearing those arms. You know? And uh, this view of migration as being strictly related to the economy uh, is part of the explanation why we didn't want to see that migrants and then their descendants were like anybody else, uh, artistic persons, not more, not less. It, you know, something to be, to be discussed. And from the start, if I take an example from the uh, uh, history of migration in, in this country, I'm, I'm now in, in Belgium, in Brussels, uh, when Belgium and Italy signed uh, an agreement to import mine workers from Italy. Well, from the beginning, uh, these Italian workers that were arriving in Belgium started some of them to write 
novels, poetry, uh, they continue to play the music. Uh, and I remember myself in the family gatherings uh, when I was a kid, uh, always at each meeting, somebody would take up an accordion or a guitar and people were starting to sing, to share uh, songs from the, the country of origin, to dance. Actually, they were developing a cultural and artistic practice, of course, under the radar. It was not known by society. The second uh, reason why the sociology of migration has neglected uh, the arts until very recently is that, you know, arts is a bit like sport. It's considered to be a trivial issue. Uh, it doesn't meet really the social demands in this very troubled period. So if you look at funding until recently, it was of course much easier to find funding if you would, you know, develop a project on how to prevent uh, radicalization of third generation Muslims, for example, than if you would develop a project on the artistic production among immigrant minorities. And so this is a, a view I, I'm with my colleagues who are really uh, challenging very strongly. Uh, we do believe that, you know, arts like sport has, has re really a lot to tell us about the changes that occur on a daily basis in our society. And so it is, we think, very important to look at, uh, at those issues. Well, depending on the country, of course, uh, towards the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, the artistic production of migrants and ethnicized minorities, sometimes inspired by the experience of migration and discrimination, uh, were progressively seen as modes of changing, enriching the local culture so, through different processes like artistic melting, fusion, invention of new syncretic artist, artistic forms. Well, we've done a, a lot of work on, especially on music, and well, I could I could uh, mention many examples, but for example, the rise the rise of the uh, high music in in France. Well, the history of high music is of course in the north of Algeria. Originally, it's sung without instruments and especially by women. Well, in the eighties in France, it became the the mode of expression of the second generation immigrants that were at the time started to mobilize against racism. And Rai actually, they were the Rai they were playing had really not so much to do with the original Rai uh, songs of Algeria, but it was sort of urbanized, mixed in up, adding instruments like also electrical instruments, but keeping some modes of singing and sometimes also uh, taking songs from the French repertoire and giving to those songs a very different meaning. Uh, I could talk about that for hours, but just to mention that example, it's really one example of how uh, these artists started to, to create something new, adapted to where they were living and to the struggle they were trying to push forward. Well, we could take many examples in different parts of the world, but like, Tex-Mex music in the US was something that actually is strongly connected to the history of migrations with the S in the southern states of the US. And so progressively attention was paid by cultural studies, anthropology and sociology of cultures to these productions. Another strand of study relates to ethnic and racial domination in the artistic field as well. Well, um, many people think that the artistic worlds are by nature open and uh, you know immune from discrimination and domination. We know that it's, it is not true. Uh, if you read the history of jazz in, in, in the US, uh, there were actually lots of issues linked to the main, mainstreamization of jazz 
and how it related to the continued domination of the white majority. And that explains also why African-American musicians invented new styles in order to recreate and reprocess, retake possession of the, their mode of expression. The same is true from, for the blues uh, that, you know, originally we all know the history of the blues. Uh, it uh, originates, of course, from, uh, from Africa. And when it, grew, it became a uh, major mode of expression in the Southern states of the EU, especially sung by uh, people with little formal education uh, living in rural areas. Uh, and most of them were African-Americans. Well, today, who listens, who plays the blues in the US? It's mainly white, middle-class, middle-aged, or even more than middle-aged white men. So what does it tell us about appropriation of artistic forms in our divided societies? And maybe we could continue and develop also this view with hip hop and how basically it became also a matter of appropriation by people who were not originally involved in the movement. Uh, actually today, hip hop is, has become, as you know, a global phenomenon, but if we look at sales, uh, well, a few years ago, there were studies made about who buys who, when people were still buying records, who buys uh, rap albums and, and CDs, well, uh, that study was showing it was mainly white, uh, middle and upper class uh, suburban kids that were uh, buying uh, these records. So my claim here is really uh, to, to, to convince, and I'm pretty sure you are convinced, but not everybody is uh, outside, you know, the, the people who are not really necessarily on a daily basis in all these debates. Um, really, it's crucial to better understand the relevance of the arts in the theoretical, but also in the political and policy debates on migration, immigrant integration, and also diversity in our cities that are in constant flux. And my colleague Steve Vertovac talks about super diverse cities. And actually, yes, there is a kind of process of diversification of our cities in which actually the artistic part plays uh, an important role. Even more in our, uh, somebody was talking about earlier uh, about um, austerity. Yes, we are today still in uh, a phase of history where social and economic inequalities are still there, are growing, and increasingly social and economic relations are ethnicized and racialized. And in my view, it is in this very specific and difficult context, it is really important to look at what art, what the arts can play, what the arts play as a role in uh, these uh, societies. And to do so, I think it's important to uh, develop research in five domains, uh, local cultures and artistic expression, social relations and interactions, of course, the dimension of cultural policies and local integration policies, four, uh, political mobilization and participation, and five, the economic life. And I will just uh, say, tell you a few elements about these five dimensions before opening up for discussion. So as I already mentioned, um, the, when people meet in our uh, societies of, uh, of immigration, and by the way, I take uh, here the opportunity to, to claim for a broader, broader change of paradigm that we should really make in, in Europe. And when I say Europe, I include, I still include the UK in Europe, uh, is that you know, we should stop seeing my, migration as something that is problematic, as something that does not belong to our history. But migration is something that constructs and reconstructs societies. Migration is a structural phenomenon. So, uh, and it will continue to be uh, whatever the 
exit will be in the Brexit debates. For the UK, and it will be for Europe, it will be for the world. And I think we should include more migration as a, you know, as a structural mode of reconstruction of any all human society. If we do that paradigm, maybe we will see things with different eyes and try to find more uh, uh, ways of, you know, constructing these uh, projects that we hardly need for the, the future, the future of, of mankind. So if we go back to more practical and even local things, I insist on the local because many things now happen also at the local level with uh, an interaction with the global level. Well, I'm with you today, 10 years ago, probably this would not have been possible. So I'm here, but I'm with you at the same time. And it's the same, of course, for uh, many people in our societies. Going back to how migration changes local artistic culture, uh, I mentioned already a few elements of that, and we could actually take many examples. I hear, I hear mention again a couple of examples uh, on, um, on music, but we can also take the example of literature. You know, I, my generation was very, very struck by the, uh, the writer Anif Qureshi, who I think, you know, the, the, his book, The Buddha of Suburbia, was probably one of the best, you know, uh, attempt to really understand uh, the, difficult, the difficulties of uh, our diverse society, but it was, I think, in terms of writing, uh, something that has an extreme value, and it has become now part also, not only of the world literature, but certainly also of British literature. In cinema, if we want to go to Germany, the work of Fatih Akin, for example, uh, who, who is not considered anymore as a migrant a filmmaker, but really uh, his contribution to uh, the German cinema is recognized by everybody. So these people all have a kind of personal history linked to migration. They are not necessarily themselves migrants, but they might be the children of people who actually moved to European countries. And so clearly, immigrants and their descendants, they, contrary to what people still want, they do not merely assimilate to the local arts and culture. They transform the local artistic landscape and give birth to new artistic languages. Um, we have just published with my colleague from uh, CUNY, Bill Kazinitz, a special issue dedicated to music immigration and the city. And uh, Phil, in his contribution, shows how uh, Broadway actually would be unthinkable without migration. Broadway now is presented as uh, one, of best, one of the best illustrations of the, the American culture one of the touristic attractions of New York, but Broadway without immigration probably would never exist. If we look at social relations and interactions, the question we are asking is, are artistic practices uh, resources to build bridges between people, to create a new lingua franca, to create new forms of solidarity in our divided and uh, racialized and ethnicized societies. Uh, in other words, can people who, who have very severe difficulties in getting together uh, outside uh, in society, could they really use artistic practices in order to, to try to rebuild some bonds and to basically to, to recognize each other as equal members of uh, the same society. And I've been very much interested over the past uh, five, six years uh, by all this research on everyday multiculturalism. Uh, the work by, by Eris Wessendorf, 
for JRO, etc. And I've tried to uh, to observe what is going on in Belgian cities, especially in Brussels and, and, and in Liège, my city, about this everyday multiculturalism. What does it mean in the artistic sphere? Is it really something we can observe or is it simply uh, wishful thinking? You know, things that we would like to see but do not exist anymore. And I think that really it exists. Uh, people uh, develop this you know, experience of diversity, uh, they, without, of course, theorizing about it. I'm not talking about uh, an urban generation that is inspired by thinkers like uh, Kim Lika or whatever. Uh, they don't care about theorizing, but they really experience uh, modes of living together that go beyond the traditional categories of division in society, religious, gender, ethnicity, race, and social class. And they really develop uh, new ways of living together in the city. And that happens in mixed neighborhoods that still exist, uh, even though there is in many cities a process of fragmentation, also the urban space. Uh, but also um, what is important to notice is that for part of the young, diverse urban generation, the traditional forms of categorization lose salient in the modes people cooperate and live together in daily life. And this is, I would say, uh, very visible in artistic practices uh, associated sometimes to the expression we could also deconstruct of urban culture. And we could we could discuss at length to, to, to discuss what is actually uh, uh, urban culture. But still, these young people develop, uh, and I say young people because most of the time they do, they are young, and uh, uh, they develop what I call global communities of artistic practices. And I've observed, I'm still observing that in dance, in music, and theater. Actually, what matters in those communities, local communities of artistic practices, is the project. It's not that much where you are from, what are your sexual orient orientations, what is your religion or whatever. What matters is the project. In that way, they move beyond the, the, the traditional categories of division to develop what I call an, an anchored cosmopolitanism. Why? Because they are at the same time uh, embedded in the local life with a very strong feel it, feeling of belonging to, to the city or the neighborhood, but at the same time, they identify with similar groups elsewhere in the world. Uh, there are all sorts of connections between, for example, um, the people of the, the poor suburbs of Naples in Italy and people in the favelas in, uh, in Rio uh, that are made possible by also new technologies. And therefore, the role of internet and the new technologies is very important to develop these transnational connections that allow the development of what I call this anchored cosmopolitanism. Of course, there are also patterns of physical mobility. Uh, if you take the example of dance, for example, well, there are all, all year round, and especially in summer, there are all sorts of camps and workshops and festivals of dance that, you know, allow people from the entire world, that urban generation from the world, to get together and to share things uh, uh, around their same shared love for, for, for dance and uh, uh, and their similar approach to, to, to the, the place of the body in, in, in the world, so to say. So these local communities of artistic practices actually, uh, and here I quote my colleague, uh, uh, um, our colleague from the University of, uh, of uh, Tilburg in, um, in, in, in the Netherlands, Jan Blomach, he talks about online, offline communities because Actually, of course, as I said, internet is very important, but also physical meetings conserve 
uh, keep uh, uh, relevant for these people. So they really are the connection between offline and online activities. And recently, there was an example in Belgium, and I'm not going to read this, uh, in order to show how you know, artistic project, projects can really uh, help recreate uh, bonds in, a, in our society. A very interesting project was developed in, in Belgium called Refugees for Refugees. Actually, the idea was to put together uh, refugee musicians in Belgium coming from different countries, from uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, Tibet, uh, whatever, uh, uh, Syria, etc. And in order, in order to see what they could exchange. And you know that this idea that music is uh, universal doesn't mean that all the musicians understand each other very, very easily, of course. But this project uh, led to uh, a first CD that was unanimously acclaimed. Uh, they started to tour in Belgium and abroad with, with all the difficulties because some of the musicians didn't have uh, documents in order to travel. And recently they developed the second phase of the project uh, publishing a second CD and uh, you know when they launched the CD the concert was in one of the major venues in, in Brussels called the Ancienne Belgique it was sold out and now this group Refugee for Refugee is going to play uh, in all the summer festivals uh, in the area and it was quite interesting when you look at the public that go to that concert because you could say of course it's only people who are already open and convinced that go to those concerts uh, but i could see people from many different origins i could see people from different generations uh, so it was really a, a mirror of the diversity of society probably they were all open uh, to you know this issue of uh, uh, integration of refugees before going to the concert but i mean Still, in the period we live, I think it's very important also to show that people do not agree with some of the politics that is offered to us, uh, be it in the UK, in Italy, in Belgium, in, uh, in Poland, in Hungary, or and you name it. There are so many countries where you know, people need to stand up and resist. And I think that arts can give us this is not a new idea, of course, but I think it's important to underline it. Underline it. Uh, arts can give us the, the possibility to, to show to, that people together can still try to resist. Now there is the third issue, the issue of cultural policies and local integration policies. The question here is that of the re representation of diversity in cultural policies. Do official culture, cultural institutions support, for example, immigrant and origin, uh, immigrant origin artists? Do local cultural policies become multicultural or do they still reproduce a nationalist view of culture? And how do immigrant and ethnicized minority artists mobilize to change cultural policies? And here we have done some studies in different countries and there is a great variety of uh, things happening in different countries. And I think it's important to distinguish at least three levels of discussion. The, the level of cultural policies in a strict sense, uh, the issue of integration policies, and I don't like the word integration, but I still use it in order to give an idea of what we are talking about. And recently, especially uh, since the uh, the terrorist attacks that uh, uh, that happened uh, throughout the world and not only in in, in Western Europe, um, uh, policies to prevent radicalization started to use also artistic tools. Um, in terms of, I will just say a few words about the first discussion: cultural policy. There seems to be a tension that uh, has not been solved between two approaches of cultural policies. The option we could uh, label as cultural democracy, 
opposed to the uh, option of democratization of culture. Well, democratization of culture deal with this idea that there is a high culture, which is very often defined within the nationalist project, and that this elitist national culture should be spread out to the lower classes. And actually, this is a very common view in France. This is the Malraux view of, you know, let's bring high culture to, to the neighborhood. You know? Let's democratize, democratize elitist culture. But on the other end, there is more, and this is important when we talk about ethnicity and, mi and migration, the option of developing a cultural democracy. It basically is to uh, favor a bottom-up approach and to look at what people do uh, in society, what type of cultural and artistic expression develop, and from there, try to recognize that as being part of a patrimoine commun of all the residents in, in a society and even beyond, if we want, uh, of mankind. And we are still in this tension today and uh, in different countries in different ways, but uh, I think it's very, um, of course, I, I, I do, they are not necessarily totally in opposition, but I think that for a very long time, uh, as I said before, the option of cultural democracy was impossible because it was considered that there was nothing interested, interesting coming from, I would say, from below, from down there in society as that, and that people would need it, artistic guides into what is good and what is not good culture. Um, if I turn, because time is also yeah, moving very quickly, uh, political mobilization, uh, through the arts. I think, um, well, we use that typology and we'll not go through it, but uh, I think that, you know, the issue, the fourth item about identity building and negotiation is very important. I think that whatever the, the artistic form, I think that creating is always connected to identity construction, but also about, uh, identity negotiation. And in those processes, those processes are, are, I would say, crucial if you really want to create some form of resistance, of protest, uh, and maybe really change what is going on. And here also many examples uh, could be uh, taken that really show that, uh, uh, here again, I said all the artistic forms were probably music as an advantage because I would say it's, um, it's more accessible to everybody than artistic forms that maybe need more, uh, I would say, uh, code learning before really being accessible. We did also some work here on uh, the elections, you know, how uh, music was used during electoral campaigns, and we published with my colleague, my colleague Lafleur, an article on uh, how the Obama campaign, especially the first one, used music in order to try to get the Latino vote, uh, using one song that was declined in different, different local uh, types of music in order to get to different uh, fractions of the, the Latino uh, voters, uh, you know, you would have a, the reggaeton song for the East Coast, you would have the mariachi song in the middle of Texas, the Norteño, uh, the California and Mexico border, but actually it was the same song that was used in order to actually uh, convey the message to the Latino voters that Obama was the right person to, uh, to choose. But we are not saying, we cannot say that it succeeded, uh, because it's um, almost impos impossible to prove methodologically, but uh, we at least uh, illustrated why, how some uh, politicians understand that they can use some artistic forms to, to get, to convey also their message, which raises the issue of instrumentalization, of course, of uh, art. And uh, finally, I will stop with this issue of uh, the economy, 
And uh, well, it relates to the marketing of diversity and also of city branding. Uh, I think that you know, it has become a very important issues in, in, in many cities, the way the diversity will be uh, marketed by using artistic productions uh, of, of the place. And uh, well, if I take um, uh, an example, they, here again from Brussels, last summer there was a, a festival on hip hop, uh, which took place in Boza, which is the major, one of the major cultural institution in Belgium. It's really the place, the monument of the high culture opening up to hip hop in Belgium. What is very interesting is that uh, the, the origin of the project was not in the artistic world, it was the Department of Tourism of the city of Brussels. So it means that this diversity uh, is really transformed in order basically to pursue image and economic goals. The second point we see is that uh, there is a kind of artistic entrepreneurship that develops as a response to discrimination and non-recognition of, for example, ethnicized and racialized artists. So uh, what we see in many countries is that these artists don't even apply for funding anymore, uh, anticipating you know, refusal or uh, difficulties in order to, to, I don't know, it is in all the countries, but here you have to fill in many forms, many uh, very complex forms and report all the time uh, for what you, you do. You know, in Belgium, there is a kind of status of artist, but in order to get it, you have to prove that you, uh, you have performed something like uh, 200 uh, shows, for example, over a year. I mean, who can do that in a country like Belgium? It's almost impossible. So in order to get around all that, people organize by themselves and develop their small artistic firm in order to continue their work. And so in the end, this has a kind of positive impact on employment as well. Uh, and of course, the other side of the coin is that sometimes, well, the, um, the, the, the governments well, are not so tempted to continue to address the issues. So I will stop here just by giving the last word to Gérard Mortier, who was an opera director. And a few weeks before he died uh, in 2014, uh, he gave, he released an interview with uh, one of the major newspapers in, in Belgium. And uh, excuse me for maybe the bad translation. One thing he said was that politicians consider artists and intellectuals to be negligible as a decorative framework. If everything went well, we would not need artists, but the great revolutions we, fared, we face are frightening people. They are fleeing from materialism. So I am at least convinced that this fear can be filled with art, science, philosophy. Art does not reconcile us with life. It helps us to face better. And I think this is really a crucial statement for the development of our multicultural and super diverse society. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Marco. Um, despite the smoothness of the stream, um, with the, if we do a Q&A, &A, um, it's a little bit cumbersome because Marco can't hear everything we're saying. So if we do, do we'll do a short Q&A now. P can I ask you to make your uh, questions very concise? I will then need to relay them to Ben, who is then talking to, to Marco. Can you hear me, Marco? Yes, more or less. <laughs> oh, OK. <laughs> OK, does anybody have any questions they'd like to relate to Marco? Work. Yeah. Uh, Thierry Gourmelin from France. Um, I have a question about uh, the, your network of research. I would like to know if you are working with a philosopher or sociologue or 
other thinker <coughs> coming from Africa or other countries. So can I just confirm that you're asking Marco about um, his network of research? Yeah. Ben, can you pass it on, please? Can I respond now or you take? Yeah, uh, yes, we are actually trying to, 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 to work with colleagues from you know, the parts of the world we are, we are connected with. And we developed a project, and if you are interested, I can circulate the information. A project uh, with um, our colleagues from, uh, from Congo. Uh, it was about arts in connected cities, actually. Uh, so, yes, we do work with uh, colleagues from other parts of the world, but uh, I would like to stress that, that what we want to do is to work on an equal footing. So I'm not interested in being part of, you know, these projects about de development and so on. When I work with colleagues from other parts of the world, uh, it's colleagues on exactly the same footing. And I would like to revive also an idea that was developed about 25, 30 years ago about reciprocal social sciences. So instead of, you know, continuing this idea that we Europeans have the right to study the South and to teach them how to do what they want, they need to do, I would like to have more, even more uh, scholars from uh, the various places in the South to come to Europe to teach us how to do things and to give us, you know, their analysis of our society. So I'm really in favor of developing these reciprocal uh, uh, approaches to the issues of diversity, migration, or whatever. And uh, of course, it's not that easy because we are still very often caught in this development uh, paradigm, which in my view, is um, not necessarily the best to develop the type of reflections we are trying to, to develop. Okay, do we have any more questions? Okay, um, thank you, I'm, I'm being cons so, Okay, T please wait for the microphone. Uh, hello, my name is Julie Ward and I'm a member of the European Parliament on the Culture and Education Committee, but I'm also a poet, a theatre maker. And I, I wanted to ask a question about research um, because uh, participatory action research is, a, for me, a more equal way of working with communities who... Um, uh, are often in very uh, difficult, challenging situations, unequal, don't have access to higher education or research grants. Um, but I do know that the academic community cannot then um, necessarily give those participants the acknowledgement in the, res in the published research. And this was an issue for some people that I knew. So how can we change uh, how can we change, if you like, the old system so that the, so that the participants in those, you know, because this is people researching their own experiences and they're experts of their own experience, but they don't get the acknowledgement that I feel they should get if they participate. Ben, can you just check that, that Marco uh, the understood yeah. the question? Uh, <clears throat> I think that, um, well, we, we do a lot of uh, participatory research and every, everything, everybody is, of course, uh, credited. Uh, last example I can give, we are developing a, a project with uh, a group of undocumented migrants in Liège that uh, are squatting a public building, have been squatting a public building for two years. They, develop, they have developed uh, all sorts of artistic activities, including uh, writing workshop that became a theater play. And actually a colleague of mine, Elsa Mescoli, was involved in that project and the, did that type of participatory research was presented 
at an international conference. And uh, of course, the, 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 uh, it was, the, the paper, if you want, was signed by the researcher, by also the leader of the undocumented migrant, the leader of the workshops. So we, of course, we are, uh, we, we are very, we pay attention to that. It's very important. Uh, however, uh, I also see a risk in what you said, that being that everybody is an expert of his own life and so on. I think we have also to, to take into account the danger of uh, segmenting and fragmenting uh, knowledge. Uh, you know, it was told to me several times in the past that uh, I had no legitimacy to speak about anything else than immigrant, Italian immigrants in Belgium because I was myself the son of an Italian immigrant. And I think this is, in my view, this is uh, uh, the end of any project for the social sciences. Uh, I think everybody should have the right to study and to say anything about any topic. Uh, and the truth comes by a combination of different point of views. So, you know, um, uh, well, we could talk about that probably for all day. And there is also the issue of, uh, of uh, retribution that comes into play. So uh, increasingly, uh, people say, well, if you want an interview, you just have to pay because I have the expertise and uh, you have to pay if you want my expertise. We can discuss about that. I understand the logics, but uh, I think there are also dangers to that. Uh, because then, well, uh, we can say that sometimes there are just, uh, you know, a, a pre-formatted discourse that it just served against retribution to journalists, to politicians, to administrators, and so on, uh, just because that's, you know, people respond to what they think is expected from them. So I think you raised a very a simple question, but that opens up to very complicated discussion. But the point of departure is that, uh, at least for academics like myself, uh, the idea of the ivory tower and of people who are not connected, who are not crediting the people they work with, is something that is really strange to me. In all we do, uh, we not only we we. We ask, we enlarge the participation, but we credit, of course, all the people who participate in what we construct together. Okay, thank you, Marco. Um, I'm going to, I apologize, I'm going to close the Q&A there. Um, if you want to uh, contact Marco, you can obviously contact him through his profile on the ITM website. Um, so, um, just to say that uh, if I could request that, now this is finished, that we... Um, uh, we clear the auditorium quite quickly for two reasons. One, we have a matinee in here at 1 p.m. And also, sessions are starting in the building and across the city at half 11. So but before we do, can we just express our thanks to Marco? Thank you, Marco. Thank you.